strip grazing milo is our next topic and Rusty Lee, our field specialist in agronomy from Montgomery County, will be addressing this, has some personal experience with this. A lot of people want me to be sure and go ahead and put the disclaimer out that they don't endorse this crazy idea, but some things from Montgomery and Warren County, this part of the state, a lot of crazy ideas and every now and then uh, we find a, a goose that's laying a golden egg. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. So strip grazing milo as an alternative winter feeding strategy. So what we've got is we need to, to figure out the why. And this data from Iowa State sort of illustrates what a lot of cattle producers already realize, that the variable with the high profit and loss is feed cost. And out of feed cost, I submit that the, the largest portion of that is winter feed cost, the stored feed cost. So we're going to consider some out of the box thinking. This is about as far out of the box as you can get. So what we're doing here is we are feeding in place milo grown for a grain crop to the cattle just directly consumed in situ in the field. This is allocated to the animals based upon yield. We are controlling the, the pounds of grain that the cattle are consuming on a daily basis. It does involve polywire divisions and, and daily movement, but we can really custom tailor a, a diet to the animals, allow them to feed in this place. Milo can be grazed green. However, the majority of the producers that I work with, we're using this as a winter feed source and we typically start November the 1st as the first day of grazing the Milo. A very low cost system, that's the underpinning of this on yield. So yield estimates are made once the uh, Milo is matured and before we start feeding. 10 pounds per mature animal per day is a real good starting point. It depends on the, uh, the, the opportunity for additional stockpile fescue grazing or, or other feeds that may be available. We do have producers feeding the milo as the sole source of intake, uh, at which point you're gonna see a, a 12, 13, 14 pound per day grain intake. But with a little stockpile fescue for some supplemental protein, 10 pounds of, of milo grain allocation does really well. This, once it's laid out, a four-wheeler is just going to run down some rows, create our divisions, and then just step in post and a real lightweight polywire to divide. I will say this does require cattle that already have a healthy respect for electricity and polywire. So an animal's energy requirement. So we're feeding energy in copious amounts with all this grain. And so as the nutritional needs can change with the season, so can the allocation unit. The snow, the freezing rain, all of that just doesn't seem to stop this system. It works in all conditions that we've encountered so far. So you'll notice that the density of the animals in the allocation are pretty high. The higher the grain crop that, you know, the higher your bushels, we're shooting for 120 bushel milo yield and the closer you get to that the less square feet we need per animal so it does look somewhat like a feedlot on the daily allocation. We have noticed that when you're giving the allocation in about the right size it takes 30 minutes for the cattle to consume all of the grain heads. That is the first item they go for is the grain heads. When that's gone they turn to the fodder leaves and they turn to the stalk and all of the plant is consumed except for the bottom 18 inches of stalk. That's what they leave behind. That process takes about two hours. And we're going, when we do advance this slide, you'll see these cattle 24 hours later, they march to the right of the screen to the next allocation and we can see what residue is left behind. So the cattle are now on the right half of the picture. Uh, they're sort of blending in with the, with the milo there, but you can see the residue that's behind. We don't force them to eat everything to the dirt, but we are getting high utilization in this. So nutrition is a key piece, understanding the animal's nutrition. So Larry here, this is a Lincoln County producer. He's having a visit with Anita and Daniel, some field specialists in livestock. And 
we are making sure that the nutritional needs are being met. You can see with the residue being left behind, Larry is giving the animals a little bit bigger of an allocation than they really need. There's a lot of fodder leaves that they're not taking advantage of here, but this was his first year of doing it and he was just kind of getting it figured out. I can tell you, that as you consider this system, you need to have a plan in place for supplemental protein. The Milo, we've tested the grain and the leaves repeatedly, and we continue to consistently find a 7% protein level on a dry matter basis. And so that's going to leave us needing to supplement protein. But as we consider expenses, which is cheaper to supplement protein or energy? And so with the energy being taken care of with the grain, we've got a lot of this expense taken care of. Now that we've covered how we go about it and the why, let's look at the dollars and cents and see, does this really make sense? So I'm pulling numbers from the MU Extension hay budget. This is a 2019 hay production budget. And its assumptions are $40 land use cost, that it's a fescue clover mix that's making this state average 3.15 ton per acre yield. And they're coming up with a total cost of production of baling hay round bales of $60 per ton. I'm now taking that number and saying I'm working with thousand pound round bales and that's putting me at $30 a bale. So then my numbers, just for argument's sake, I'm saying a 1,200 pound cow consuming 3% of her body weight is taking in 36 pounds of this hay per day per cow. So at $30 a bale, 1,000 pound bale, I'm at three cent a pound. Real quick, you come out with a dollar and eight cent hay cost for that cow per day. That's at $30 a bale hay. Now, anybody that thinks hay is $30 a bale, go ahead and put your name and phone number in the chat and we'll get with you after this program to see about buying some of that hay from you. Most people will agree that, that hay is more of a $40 item. Uh, I have some producers that think it's more of a 45, but somewhere in that 35 to $45 range, $40 is a pretty good spot. That puts us at a dollar and a half. So we're basically talking about a dollar and a half a day to feed hay through the winter. And remember, we're still gonna need to add supplemental energy. In the Milo field, here's some simple math that I'm using. I'm shooting for 120 bushel per acre yield, 56 pounds in a bushel. That's giving me 6,700 pounds of grain to work with. Now we've followed behind the cattle and we've looked at the waste and tried to come up with a number for utilization and the cattle are bringing into their mouths at least three quarters of the grain that was out there. So if we have a 75% utilization, that puts us at 5,000 pounds of grain on an acre basis. And if I'm looking at 10 pounds per cow per day consumption, that's 500 cow days to the acre. Now you tell me what we're going to do that's gonna generate 500 cow days to the acre feed silage perhaps. There's a lot more expense in chopping and hauling and feeding silage than this system. So it is impressive the cow days that we can generate at such a low cost. So the cost that I use for the Milo production comes straight out of MU Extension's grain sorghum budget. Okay, so now this budget doesn't include land cost, but it does include something that I don't have as an expense and that's harvest cost. So I'm gonna use their numbers minus the combined truck and grain men storage hauling cost, okay? It's amazing when you stop spending money producing Milo with the planter and the herbicide spray application, you've stopped at the 60% cost of production mark. 40% of the Milo expense is the harvest and post-harvest handling. Just a little FYI. With that 75% utilization, 500 cow days to the acre, I've got my sorghum budget and I've adjusted the numbers to take out the mechanical harvest because we are harvesting with the animals. If you charge yourself $150 per acre land rent cost, you're still feeding your cattle for less than 80 cents per day. If we look at $100 per acre land rent expense, we're at 69 cents per day. And if you remember back apples to apples, the land use expense in the hay budget was $40 per acre. So $40 per acre land, and we were feeding hay for a dollar and a half a day. If we grow the Milo instead of the hay field, we can feed the, the cattle for 57 cents per day. 
So just to put it all on one page, wherever you think your true cost of hay comes in at, you can draw your conclusions. I'm saying we're closer to a dollar and a half than we are one dollar. And with the Milo, you can be somewhere around between 60 and 70 cents, depending on how you want to value the use of your land. So we can take what is the single largest expense or the, the largest variable in explaining profit and loss, and we can cut that in half. That is significant. So it's at this point that the person start thinking, yeah, but there's gotta be a downside. Okay, here's one. You're gonna go move this poly wire every day. Okay? No matter what, you're gonna go move it every day. And when it's above freezing and it's wet, it's muddy in a crop field. So the cattle do pug up. The good news is, is on the day that this pugging occurred, those cattle had to stand somewhere better in my crop field then in that background, you see the green pasture. They're not over there destroying that permanent pasture that now has to be reseeded. What they did is they performed some tillage in a crop field. This field has already had the disc pulled over this spring and it is awaiting the planting of Milo for a continuous Milo operation on grazing again this winter. So the expense to bring back into production, the wintertime pugging, not really an issue. While this is a great system with cattle, our friends with small ruminants, the sheep, the goats, understand it works even better with them as these animals do not require daily moves. They do not require daily allocations. I've got this one neighbor with uh, 200 ewes and he can give them 10 acres and uh, come back in a few weeks. Uh, everything's fine. As you can see in this picture, they choose to eat from the outside in. They don't wander and knock down and waste as cattle would. So it's all about the waste and the overconsumption with the cattle that we do daily allocations. With these small ruminants, it doesn't appear to be an issue. So with that, I wanna give a little credit to the NRCS MU Grasslands Project, part of the support for me being able to get out and preach the gospel on strip grazing Milo. And I'll take questions and leave this slide here. If anyone wants to reach out to me later, there's the email or phone number. i uh, be glad to talk about strip grazing Milo in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Rusty. Very novel idea and it's an interesting concept that a lot of people haven't ever considered. And this is really the time to be thinking about this. That's why we did it today, because uh, it'll be time to be planting Milo or grain sorghum here pretty soon. 60 degree soil temperatures are fine. Milo can make quite a good grain crop. It doesn't need to be planted in April necessarily. Uh, most of the producers in East Central Missouri, they plant corn, they plant beans, and when they're finished with beans, they plant Milo. That, that seems to be not too bad of a plan. So there'll be a good little bit of Milo in East Central Missouri planted the next time it dries out because we are right there at the sweet spot if we can just get back in the field. Not being a livestock nutrition person, I'm going to give you an observation. Here's the deal. Milo is a little harder to digest. It is a little slower to digest. It's not as readily digestible as my understanding. That's part of the reason that explains why we can take cattle and go from a fescue pasture on November the 1st and shove them into a grain field and we have not had one case of foot problems or overeating. You have to understand that this process of strip grazing Milo has been going on since 1996. I've got one producer in Montgomery County that has fed 120 cow herd every winter doing this for the last 23 years. So we have not had one overeating issue and part of it is due to that slower digestibility. Now here's the other piece. So rather than, as just a cow man, rather than worrying about all of that, here's what I worry about. Do the cattle look good? Do they come out of winter in good condition? Do they breed back? Do they, do they have a calf? Is everybody happy? Yes. What did it cost you to do that? Half of feeding hay, end of story. Okay, so maybe if we can get Eric or someone else to, to comment about that digestibility question, they've got more science than I do on that. You're absolutely right in digestibility. The difference between unprocessed Milo and processed Milo is probably 20%, whereas the difference between shell corn and cracked corn is only 10%. So there's a bigger gap. But I think really what it comes down to in the long run is, like you alluded to, it provides a margin of safety. If you slow down the rate of digestion, 
you run less risk of having acidosis and things like that pop up. And for me, the big takeaway when you think about this whole system in a broader picture is that you produce far superior number of pounds of TDN per acre per unit of land area for your cows doing this than you do using regular pasture forage. It might seem a little off on the outset, but I have zero concerns with grain. In fact, I regularly talk to producers, especially now in the era of $3 and 25 cent to bushel corn about considering the cost of using grain as a supplement when you're deficient in energy of cow herds across the state, not just defaulting to our old faithful, our old, reliable, hey, it's getting to a point where we're seeing the grain prices at a point where we can use them as a supplement effectively when we've identified that our deficiency in our cow herd is energy particular. Another key benefit to this in my estimation is the manure management, the nutrient management. If I'm feeding silage and I've got that additional expense of cutting, you know, chopping, hauling, packing, now I'm feeding it out. Well, I'm also got to scoop, scrape, and haul manure and spread that back on the fields. And with this system, we've got daily moves, we've got excellent manure distribution, and those nutrients are not leaving the farm. If I sold that grain for, you know, the $3, I see that plant nutrition leave my farm. In this situation, it's on the farm somewhere. They may have carried some of it back out in the pastures as they back graze some stockpile fescue, but there's significant savings in plant nutrition as well. Well, our observation is that it doesn't take a lot of nitrogen to grow 100 to 120 bushel milo. So we don't get too carried away with over fertilization. The next piece is the cattle seem to stop on the stalk and they leave that bottom 18 inches. So the portion of the plant with some of the highest residual nitrate, they're not consuming. Thus far of the producers I visit with regularly that do this system, we have not ran into an issue with nitrate poisoning or any complications from that. I've got some producers that do the milo and have tried the standing corn. So there's a couple of things here. One, corn is a lot easier to digest, right? And so it's easier or quicker to get into a founder issue. So you got to manage that a little tighter. The other is the milo doesn't lodge nearly as much as the corn does. So the milo, we're asking that grain to stay up dry for the ground for, you know, November, December, January, February, and corn fields start looking pretty ratty by Valentine's. Uh, so there are some limitations to that. And the cattle seem to behave differently when they're in a corn field that they cannot see out of whereas in a milo field, they can stand there and see whatever makes them feel comfortable. They can see the horizon. So you can use corn, uh, some producers have, but those guys have come back to the standard milo. So I don't have any data. You know, I haven't done it long enough to see that trend. One would think that we're leaving all of the residue in the field. We're leaving as much as we can. I would like to think that there's some benefit to that. It does involve tillage, so there's going to be some organic matter decrease from that, right? So whether the tillage just be the hoof action of the cattle or what have you when it's wet and muddy. So the jury's out. I don't have good data to talk about the organic matter impact.